Shall I get started? Yep. All right. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Laura Devazine. I'm a staff engineer at Datadog. I gather I'm the thing in between you and happy hour, so I promise to try really hard to be interesting. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something somewhat similar to what Fred talked about, but from a slightly different perspective. Um, so SRE as you move from startup to an established business. So let me establish a little bit of framing what I mean when I say startup. Startups are companies that are dead by default, right? If you don't ship, you're dead. You can't make payroll in three months. If you have an SRE team at a startup, they need to be focused on the same mission as everyone else. Get a product out the door as soon as possible, right? You probably don't have a bunch of fancy stuff like incident reviews and SLOs, and you shouldn't be using the finicky cool technology that takes a couple of months to get set up right. The goal is to get to sustainability as a company before you run through all of your investor money. What you're going to do as a startup is take on debt, some of that in the form of investor money, some of that in the form of technical debt, in order to get to that launch moment. Um, and I want to credit some of this insight to uh, a talk that uh, Emil Stolarski gave at SRECon in EMEA, so in Amsterdam just last year, uh, about a unified theory of SRE, where he really was talking about how to be an SRE company, how to be an SRE team at a startup, really thinking very hard about this default dead position. But we're a startup, right? The goal is to get to that moment when it's a success. The rocket ship takes off, you hit hypergrowth. You move from default dead to default alive. And I'm speaking specifically with some of this as insight inside of Datadog. I can pull up all sorts of graphs at Datadog that have this shape. This one happens to be commits over time. So this is, in general, code committed by engineers at Datadog over time. Those numbers at the beginning are not zero. They're just so small you can't see the difference. And lots and lots of graphs have this shape, right? They're this long period of sort of not a lot of growth, and then we've got a little bit of a growth, and then we've got the rocket ship. So Datadog is very much a company that's doing this transition, that's been in this transition for a while now. Uh, it was a startup, it was a startup for kind of a long time, and now it's moving to hypergrowth or been in hypergrowth for a while. But as I said, we took on some debt, right? We were a startup for a long time. Startups take on debt. Let's talk about that. What do I mean when I say debt? So first of all, you've got tech debt, right? What do I mean when I say tech debt? It can mean a lot of things. It can be features that can't take 10 times or 100 times as much traffic without falling over. It can be a total lack of API boundaries. You have 1,500 engineers who all work in the same monolith, or 1,500 engineers who all access the same database with the root database password. It can mean that team A over here uses Kubernetes and Envoy for service discovery, but team B over here is using EC2 instances and has hard-coded IP addresses for service discovery. It probably means that a lot of basic systems engineering that we tend to focus on as SREs just isn't widespread or it's completely lacking. So you see systems with things like infinite retries with no back off or timeouts set to 15 minutes on calls that normally take 500 milliseconds, services that might require full mesh client connections by design, traffic sharding that's hard coded or risky to change, right? If you want to shard where your traffic goes to, it's a high risk operation. And I want to emphasize when I call out these kinds of debt, the company was right, right? Any startup company is likely to have been right to take on this kind of tech debt in order to get off the ground. It was important to get a product out the door quickly, and designing it better would have taken too long. But now we're here. We have to pay interest on this debt, right? It's debt. You have to deal with it, and dealing with tech debt is a way of paying interest. And we'd like to start to pay it down. We've got other kinds of debt. We have things like manual operations. So historically within a startup, human time is going to be cheaper than building and running operations, uh, than building and running your, your automation. So if you have 10 engineers and they've got to get a product out the door ASAP, right? Just paging them or just having one of them briefly be interrupted to upscale something, that's cheaper than building a large scale solution or building automation to that problem. And so as a result, you wind up with manual operation work as a systems foundation. It's everywhere. Uh, you need to scale up services. You need to, you need to change what processes are using what data or what processes are sharded how. You need it to handle and block abusive customer traffic. You need uh, manual work to do integration testing, to do your deployments. Manual operations are perceived as normal. They're often perceived as safer or preferred to automation. But the opportunity cost to your humans is going to rise. 
uh, as you have more humans and more services, and this becomes a really unsustainable form of debt as well because people are used to doing these manual operations, but that opportunity cost is just higher and higher. And on the tail of that operational challenge, you've also got ways that you do on-call and operations. Um, every engineer may be expected to and need to know the whole stack, including how your service discovery works, what specific machine instances they're running on. They might need to know that to build or debug just about anything. Um, if you're running in a you build it, you run it model, right, and you don't have platforms in uniformity, every stack is different, so every developer has to know their own stack. It'll be common, or it can be common, to page a human for products that affect a single customer. They might even self-resolve because, again, you've got this preference for manual operations, but also because single customers meant a lot more when you were a startup. You couldn't afford to piss off that one customer. On-call rotations might be too small. Um, again, your teams are used to being small, scrappy teams who have to do a lot of individual work, and so you might have on-call rotations with three people in them, two people in them. Um, those are not going to be sustainable. You probably have incidents that don't get reviewed, which means that you don't look at the underlying causes of your problems. We fix the bug and move on, and that allows our systems to become less stable over time. And finally, you've got cultural friction. Many employees who come from a startup think of process as a terrible thing. That's part of why you work at a startup. You hate process. Um, so for example, a thing that's actually been said to me, uh, being required to write and present a postmortem feels like punishment for having an outage. I'd rather just fix the problem and move on, right? And if that's team's perception of process, that's going to be hard to change. Teams are generally unaccustomed to thinking about or being subject to global cost optimization rather than optimizing for their own team. Again, as your scale grows, problems that made sense to solve on one team now reflect onto other teams and other teams have to manage whatever sort of externalities you've got from those changes. Teams might resist migrations because they make the individual team less efficient. Teams requesting migrations rarely think about those large distributed costs of requiring every team to migrate. OK, well, all that sucks. Um, but we're SREs, we're engineers. We like to fix things. Our company is no longer in ship or die mode. This tech debt is, has accumulated. It's becoming a very large cost for the company. And you probably want to fix it. So let me talk about who you likely are when you come in to fix this. You might be a person who's been at the company for a long time, although that's often not common. You're probably hired from somewhere else as an expert SRE. And so how do you think about establishing credibility? If you come from some other company into a, a startup that's built up this big platform, why should they listen to you, right? And saying I was at Google or I was at Amazon and we did it this way, that's a terrible reason. Something that worked there wouldn't have worked when the company was a startup. Why would it work now? And maybe it won't. So as an individual and as a team, how do you establish credibility? And the very first thing you do to establish credibility is to listen. Why are things built the way they are? Work from the assumption that these were the right choices at the time. This is the same blamelessness assumption that you would make in analyzing an incident, but you're thinking about it for the whole tech stack. Um, again, the decisions made in the past were the best ones in the moment. We can move on from them now. We should do things differently now. But you have to be excruciatingly clear that you believe they were the right way when they were done. If you ask people, again, you're hired as this know-it-all SRE from somewhere else, you come in and you start asking people, well, why is it this way? That carries an implicit judgment. People will hear, I think it's wrong. So you have to ask things like, can you help me understand the context of this design choice? Or do you know the limitations that led to this design choice? Right? Assume that people had good reasons and make sure that that's clear in your question. Uh, you can take some time to actually do the work. So if you would like people to make changes to how they do their observability or how they do their on-call, join that team for a few weeks. Find out what they do. Try doing it. It's probably really hard. Uh, don't expect to be good at it. And it's okay to say really publicly that you struggled with that work. Validating that your dev's job is hard is actually incredibly valuable towards, towards establishing that credibility. If they hear you say, I think your job is hard, I want to make it easier, that's going to take you a long ways. 
And then finally, you have to sell this to management. Even if you've been at the company for a long time, as you had hyper growth, companies often hire a layer of management. So this layer of management might be new, even if you're not. And you need to establish credibility with them as well. Why will doing things your way make the bottom line better? Right? If I want to establish SRE practices at a company, if I want to do incident reviews, if I want to automate, if I want to establish a platform, why is that going to make the company more money? Um, you could do things like get information on the opportunity costs or reliability challenges as reliability challenges of existing tech debt and infrastructure. You can do things like look at the attrition that you can attribute to on-call burnout. Right? Those are things that you can look like that you can look at to get management to understand why there's an issue. You can also explain why some new process might give management more visibility for less time investment. What's the advantage to the company as a whole? Why does this help the bottom line? Because that's how you get resources to solve this problem. Now, in any organization, there is an infinite amount of making it run better. You could do all sorts of things. You could do this forever. When we want to transition our SRE team from startup mode to serious business, probably two dozen or so things you really wish you could fix right now. There's almost certainly not enough people on your team for that. So how do we scope that down? How do we make a plan? And generally, prioritize where current pain points are felt most acutely, either in engineer satisfaction or company reliability or sometimes both. Prioritizing those helps you build that credibility that you'll need to keep solving problems. Um, some examples could be single team focused. So as an example, your database team is being asked to provide S SQL query level access to the entire company-wide database instance with 100% uptime, they're probably feeling some pain, and so is everyone else. Or maybe every time a customer sends us more traffic, we have a two-hour incident that requires a team to reshard. That would be terrible, right? That would be a good thing to maybe focus on. Or they can be small issues that relate to many teams, like standards for how quickly to respond to a page very wildly and generate significant friction between teams. Or maybe we routinely page many teams for single customer small impacts, and we should work to resolve that. If you've got a list of specific problems you want to address first, cluster them. Right? There's underlying causes. Just like you would do this for a postmortem, what are the contributing factors here? So for example, thinking that failure is not normal as a company. Right? Um, or other examples might be engineers use this piece of infrastructure badly. Uh, we're missing a tool, or we have too many tools to do some important, important distributed system thing. And you want to address, you want to take those root causes, right, those contributing factors, and put them in clusters. You're still going to have to prioritize. Choose a number of things to work on, which might be one thing that your SRE org is actually big enough to do. You do no one a favor by trying to do too many things at once. You have to pick one cluster. OK, so let's pick some stuff. Uh, you're late to the party. Right? You've probably been hired after the company's been in hypergrowth for a while. Uh, and there's going to be a lot more engineers doing things wrong than you have SREs to tell them how to do it right. So like every SRE team ever, you need to think about scale. How do you scale your efforts at cultural and technological change? If the problem's technology, right, you build or start using a specific piece of infrastructure, and you help teams migrate to it. You don't just demand that they do. Again, you put your skin in the game, you get in the, on the ground with them, and you do that migration with them. And you make the migration easy. You build the tooling for them. If the problem's cultural, you might build process to make changes to company onboarding, or you might do presentations. You might have one-on-one -on -one conversations with colleagues. You might host office hours. Uh, again, you might build tooling that pushes the cultural change forward. It depends on what you need to do to change people's thinking. Don't plan to do all the work yourself. Think about how you build self-sustaining solutions and how you build natural champions for your changes. Don't try to teach deep expertise to a few people at a time and then sort of hope they'll figure out how to transmit it to their org. That's not going to scale fast enough. And the people that you build up that way aren't going to be rewarded for that time. So instead, think about small champions, people who see a problem and think, oh, I heard SLOs could solve this. And then they say that to their team, who maybe reach out to your SRE team for more detailed help. And think about that SRE toolkit, right? We have a toolkit for a reason. That's SLOs, incident reviews, postmortems, production readiness reviews, uh, structured and limited on call and ops expectations, the reflex to automate things. That's sort of our SRE toolkit. It's there for a reason. It can help you address underlying cultural and technical problems that are causing pain. Don't apply the ritual blindly, though. Think about what problem you're solving and how that SRE toolkit solves it. Think incrementally. 
big bang solutions will take forever to show value, and you will probably get the needs of your organization wrong as you build them anyway. So how do you build technology, how do you build cultural change that improves the status quo in a quarter or even a couple of days? Right? For example, a tool that moves from ignoring vacation time when scheduling on call to one that respects it, you can probably hack that up in Python in a couple of days, ask me how I know, uh, and it'll make a huge difference. And how do you convince one person to do things differently and have them share that with their team and more broadly? And then finally, celebrate your wins. If you're trying to make large scale change, it's going to be incredibly hard, it's going to be incredibly slow. Don't lose sight of the progress that you make because then you'll burn yourself out. And then I wanna leave you with SRE as a goal, which is sublinear scaling, right? And we have a set of ways to get there. It's not a dogma to implement, it's about thinking about how do you get there. And that's it. <laughs>